Good morning. Welcome. So glad that you could join me online this morning. And as I extend a welcome to the St. Thomas family that are here in Plettenberg Bay, I'm very aware that we are, have people joining us from around the world. That's been interesting for us to discover uh, as we've developed our online ministry more and more. So if you are in New Zealand or Australia or the United Kingdom or in Canada, United States of America, welcome to you as well. And thank you for your feedback to us through our website, letting us know that you are joining us with our services, that you are enjoying them, and that you're supporting our ministry even from far away. So welcome each and every one of you. So good to meet with you this morning. Paul's going to read for us now from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, and a most remarkable reading. So I invite you to follow with us now and already ask the Lord to show you what it is that this reading needs to be saying to you, speaking to you into your life. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly a man in the synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him, Be quiet, come out of the man, he ordered. At that the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this, they asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. Friends, the theme for our message this week is power and authority in action. Just think around that for a moment, power and authority in action. But before we get into the message itself, I just want to ask you to remind yourself to learn, continue to learn to read the Bible wearing the correct spectacles, is the way that I think about it. And as you know, I'm a person that needs specs. I can't read without specs. Uh, and so I want to ask you to use the image of spectacles to help guide you in a way to understand how to read the scriptures. For example, when we read the Bible, we must use spectacles that have certain lenses in place. And the lenses in place help us to better understand what the text is trying to accomplish. So what would a lens be? Well, one of the first lenses would be, who is the author of the text? Another lens might be, when did they write that particular text? A third lens, who's the intended audience that the author is writing to in his day? Another lens, what is the point the author is trying to make to that particular audience? Remember, that audience had needs, had worries and concerns. And so the, the writer in his day, lens one, is writing to the audience, lens two, with a specific frame of reference in mind, lens three. And so on. Those sorts of lenses in place. And then to come to your own life and then say, so what is the lens of my life? When I read the text in this particular way, what is the text saying to me in the context of my life at this time? With my own experiences, in my context. And if we learn to read the Bible and study the Bible in this way with these various lenses in place, we're doing so responsibly. And we do so in a way that makes the texts come alive. So think of the biblical framework now, the biblical lenses in place, the place of your life where you find yourself. And so with that in mind, let's take a look at each of the Gospels very briefly and ask ourselves, what lenses did they present to us about Jesus at the beginning of his ministry? What is it that the Gospels, right at the outset, are trying to show us about who Jesus is to the audience of that day? And why did they take that particular approach? I'm not going to spend a long time on this, but it will make sense for you in a moment. So in Matthew's Gospel, 
He starts off with the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is shown to the audience of his day as being a great teacher, one that teaches in a very special way, a very new way, a profound way. In Luke, well, Jesus, the preacher. Jesus, the one sent by God to be on the side of the poor and the oppressed. And as Jesus preached messages like that to his audience, we know the leaders of his day didn't like that. And John, how did John present Jesus at the beginning? Well, John said Jesus is the one who shows the abundance of God in action in the world. And so John starts off the first miracle that Jesus performs is the wedding at Cana in Galilee. The abundance, the generosity of changing the water into wine. And so our reading for this week, how does Mark say Jesus begins his ministry? Well, it's about a power struggle. Interesting. Mark says right at the outset that the forces of evil are determined at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry to push back against the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of Jesus and how God will work through the life of Jesus. So Mark wants us to understand that right from the very start, of the ministry of Jesus, there was a spiritual battle underway, a battle in place. And so Mark is saying to us, and we need to have this lens on as we read the text this week, that Mark is saying that the ministry of Jesus is going to be of cosmic importance. Remember two weeks ago when I led us through that passage of Jesus being baptized in the River Jordan, we read that Jesus looked up to heaven and he saw heaven torn open and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him in the form of a dove. And then we were told that Jesus heard the voice of his Father speaking to him, saying, You are my Son, who I love. And so we began with Mark of with this power and authority of God poured over Jesus at his baptism. We used that image two weeks ago, the cascading sense of God's power and authority over Jesus. And so today, in our meditation, our passage for this week, at the very beginning of his ministry, that same God power, that same God authority, is challenged now by the forces of evil. So Mark is making it clear for us. The life of Jesus on this earth and his ability to succeed in his ministry is cosmically important. All of creation depends on Jesus getting through this in the right way. Wow. Quite a way for us to be led into our readings for this week. Power and authority. Two dimensions of life that we know all too well are so aggressively pursued and courted by many leaders in our time. For example, it's when we look more closely at the strategies and the intentions of, of political and business leaders in our world presently, we begin to see just how determined many of them are to obtain power and authority over others in the field of influence that they have. Now, in some instances, power and authority is not bad. Strong, authoritative, and powerful leaders can bring about good and prosperity and can be very positive for all of us. But at other times, this drive to have power and authority over others, and we know that recently speaking, uh, in terms of how countries have had to uh, reconfigure themselves around our world, especially with the information age that we are in, we know that even information, gathering and disseminating of information has power and authority over people. And sometimes that can be seen as being sinister and destructive and dangerous and even lead to hatred and conflict. So the social media giants at work in our world uh, the mega corporations, the presidents of countries. Uh, think again, use a lens now of our recent history, just the past three weeks. Put that lens on of world events. And so think of the recent chaos 
and that you, the United States has gone through these last few weeks, coming to the end of their time of elections and transition of power and all of that. Power and authority, very much at play all the time in how the world works, can be negative or positive. But before we stand in judgment as a church, as a Christ-following church around the world, let's remind ourselves too that history tells us that the church itself has abused power and authority in the lives of others throughout history. So the church is not innocent in these sorts of struggles either. Now Mark in his gospel wants the audience of his day to realize that our life is lived out on this earth has consequences. And the consequences are not only for those living their life on this earth, but the consequences are extended into the spiritual realm and are eternal consequences too. So once again, let me remind you that Mark is saying that Jesus' life and ministry will be challenged on earth by the forces of evil. And if Jesus is defeated in his ministry on earth, then the power and the authority of heaven is challenged and could be defeated too. And that is what Mark is getting at when he writes to his audience way back then. And so keep that lens from Mark in place this week. Friends, as we go into this meditation together, let's remind ourselves that life for Christ followers does not just happen. There are many that live life in a fatalistic way. Many around the world do that. If life happens, life happens. What happens to me happens to me, as, as if I've got no control over that. Christ followers are not fatalistic. Why? Because Jesus can influence our decisions, can guide us and help us and direct us. So we remind ourselves that life does not just happen, but life is lived by people who make decisions every day about how they will live in that day in the world. And those decisions taken, as we would say, in real time, in living time, have consequences in that moment and have consequences of an eternal nature as well. And so the decisions we take affect those of us making them and those around us receiving the consequences of our decisions. Now last week, Troy asked the question whether we believe in God, and then he followed that up with a second question, whether or not we follow God. An important distinction. We know the scriptures tell us even the demons believe in God. They don't follow God, but they believe there is a God. They believe there's a God who can act and direct things. But they choose not to follow him. And so the point that was being made last week was to believe and follow in obedience to God's call. Believe in him and follow him in obedience to his call means God can work for good in our world. Now, what has all of this got to do with you and me now? Perhaps you say, Tim, this is all sounding rather philosophical this week. Just bear with me, because Mark is presenting Jesus to us in such a way that he is saying to us that God is at work in this world right here and right now. And he's saying that just as God is at work in this world right now, so the forces of evil are at work in this world right now too. So at the beginning, God working, demons, evil forces pushing back. And friends, let's remind ourselves, as much as we invite God to work in our lives and our world now, that truth of the forces of evil pushing back is very true for us right now. So your life choices, my life choices, the choices of our leaders have consequences. And all those choices and decisions contribute in one way or the other to this ongoing cosmic battle. And then the good news, though, we know through the evidence of the life and the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus is that the victory of heaven is won. But that does not mean the struggles in this life are over. 
Far from that. The struggles for you and me for control of our lives with the power and the authority at play all the time continues. Now, an interesting little aside, just to break the seriousness of the message, is that in verses 24 and 25, there's a wonderful cultural moment taking place there. And Jesus is confronted by the evil forces in the life of the man in the synagogue. So the man's in their church, and he displays the evil forces at work. And those forces say to Jesus, Mark tells us, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And before the forces can continue speaking, Jesus interjects. He reprimands them. He says, be quiet. Jesus is emphatic. So what's this cultural play? Well, Jesus will not allow the evil forces to reveal his name to the world. When the time is right, Jesus will, re will reveal himself to the world. Now, you see, the cultural thing is, if the demons named Jesus, they would have influence and authority over him. That's how the Hebrew mind worked in Mark's day, in the day of Jesus. Think back, the creation story, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and so on. Adam was given the power and the authority to name all the creatures and the trees and the plants in creation. We are told that. You go out and you give them names, and then you have dominion over them. You have a sense of authority over them. And so in Jesus' day, to speak a name over someone was to have an influence in their life. So Jesus would not allow that to happen. So again, let's put on our, our modern lens, our own cultural influence. And we speak names over each other quite often. We can, if I look at the negative, we can speak names such as useless, loser, liar, cheat, dishonest, thief. Those are negatives. And if you think about recent divisive language that you've heard, especially in our media again, then you'll begin to under appreciate what I mean, that if we speak a name over someone or a group, we can have a power and an influence over them and direct their way of thinking, their way of acting. And so Jesus does not allow the demons to speak a name over him. The only power and authority that has the right to do that for Jesus is his Father. Go back to the baptism. You are my son. And so the meditation question for you and me this week, friends, is this. Who speaks with power and authority over your life? Who gives name to what is going on in your life. Now, for me to have said earlier, God is at work, according to Mark, God is at work right here, right now in this world. Your response might well have been, from your context, Tim, you're talking rubbish. Look at what's going on around us. Look at what's going on around me in my life. Look at the pain and the chaos. You might say, Tim, I'm isolated from my loved ones, I've lost family and friends, I'm grieving, I've lost my job or my business is, 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 is at threat with closure. What do you mean God is at work right here and right now? You must be joking. God is not in charge. Friends, be careful what we allow to speak name over us. Careful what we give authority to. And while there is so much wrong going on in the world around us, friends, there is so much good and there's so much wonder and joy at work too. So Mark also showed us in our passage that the good news will come, that this Jesus sent into the world with power and authority shows us that there is another way to live now in this life and in eternity. And this power shift and this word of authority that Jesus brings is not based on wishful thinking. But Mark will show us, and right at the outset he does that, this power and authority is built 
on obedience and answering his, Jesus, answering his father's call to action. So I want to ask you again, as you join me with the meditation question this week, what power and authority do you give to speak into your life? I want to ask you to reflect on that. So a practical way to do that. If naming something gives power and authority over that which is recognized and named, then if I'm afraid of something, for example, the fear and the loneliness of COVID and isolation, if I'm afraid of that, and then I name that, my fear, then through Jesus I can pause. Then instead of being dominated by that fear and that loneliness, I now have a choice. In Jesus, do I continue to allow that fear which I've named to direct my thinking and my actions and my sense of self? Or do I rebuke that, like Jesus did with the demons in our story? Be quiet, be silent, stop. Do I rebuke that fear and sub submit myself again in faith and obedience and in following to the power and the authority of God to work in me, to heal me of that fear. And as the psalmist says, to direct my feet as I go forward in life. Now I know this exercise is a tricky one because there's a temptation there that if I come across something I don't like, I want to just rebuke that. Uh, and Maybe it's somebody that irritates me and I want to rebuke them and I want to use this every opportunity to rebuke things, uh, which is just a convenient and manipulative way at times of getting out of dealing with real issues. I don't mean rebuking in that sense at all. I'll ask you to use the sense of rebuke in a prayerful, quiet and meditative way. And understand what you name and what you give authority to to speak over you in your life. And then in that moment to learn to listen for the other voice. I said that two weeks ago. Look up and see God coming to cover you with his power and his authority. Now Jesus was clear. The only voice to guide him would be the voice of his father. The only spirit to lead him would not be the spirit of evil but would be the Holy Spirit. Every other voice coming his way would be checked against his relationship with the Father and the authority of Scripture. We know that from the temptation stories of Jesus in the desert. So friends, this week, as you meditate this with me, what voice, what power, what authority do you give the permission to to speak over your life? Remember your decisions have consequences for you and for those around you. And those consequences are in the moment now and they are of eternal issue and consequence. So please, when it comes to power and authority, make your choice. And may your choice be made in Jesus' name. And may your choice be made for the sake of his kingdom here on earth and in heaven, now and for always. Amen.